One of the largest land mammals of all time faces off against the biggest land predator known to science. It's Paleoloxodon pneumaticus versus Tyrannosaurus rex. This fight changes the debate by involving the gigantic rex specimen E.D. Cope. Will the tyrant giant fare better against the huge elephant than Scotty did in Goji Center's analysis? Or will it be another stomp of prehistoric proportions? We'll break down the battle into categories and then decide. Comment now with your predictions on who will win this bloodlusted fight to the death. It will take place in an otherwise empty 500 foot diameter arena, withholding terrain advantages from both parties. Let's get started. Size and Strength The first thing that must be understood about size is that there is no good size estimate for Paleoloxodon pneumaticus. We don't have any complete skeletons to scale from. The material for the species consists of some skulls and fragmentary limb bones, so how its proportions may differ from other Paleoloxodon species is unknown. Additionally, the vaguely described distal femur fragment that led to the sensational 20 plus ton estimates was measured nearly two centuries ago and has since been lost, making it unable to be verified. So what size would be best to use? If T-Rex gets to field cope, it's only fair to use the biggest reliable Paleoloxodon. The highest estimate in the literature for a P. pneumaticus specimen that wasn't a chunk of distal femur was published in 2024. Biswas et al. gave an 18.47 ton number to a femur that was described in 1905, using femoral allometry. The issue is that femoral allometry has tremendous error bars and often overestimates quadrupeds. And again, this is just a single bone in a poorly understood taxon. The biggest half-decent P. pneumaticus specimen is known as Sagani 1. It consists of two partial femurs, a humerus, and an ulna, although both femurs are missing large portions of the shaft. Sagani 1 wasn't fully grown either, since the right femoral head was detached, indicating immaturity. We don't know how much more it would have grown, but the 2024 Taiwanese survey that used allometry indicated an average adult mass of about 16 tons for the species. That was almost certainly too high for an average given the methodology, but sounds a lot better than 13 tons for the largest specimen. We'll go one step further and use a speculative 17-ton, 4.5-meter-tall adult known simply as Khan. While recognizing that any actual remains hinting at such sizes equate to large bone pebbles. At any rate, that's notably more massive than its reptilian opponent. The T-Rex is fortunately much easier to scale. Cope, while on the incomplete side, is part of the best studied prehistoric genus in the world, making scaling a comparative cakewalk. His publicly measured remains consist of a maxilla, femur, tibia, and fibula, and multiple vertebrae and more skull material has also been scanned. Suffice it to say, Cope's remains average about 4-7% larger than those of Scotty and Sue, the next largest T-Rex specimens. Scaling from their conservative volumetric estimates yields a mass of about 11.7 tons for Cope, a range I verified with paleontologists Scott Hartman and Eric Snively. Cope would be about 12.9 meters long and stand about 4 meters tall at the hip, nearly looking con in the eyes, but is still 5 tons lighter. Shoving into the elephant would not be a valid tactic. While unpublished evidence does indicate that T-Rex's skull was heavily reinforced for potential use as a biological battering ram, that would only be useful against animals its own size or smaller. If it comes to a shoving contest, the Paleoloxodon has every advantage. It's bigger and can use 4 limbs to propel itself instead of 2. Khan takes both size and strength. Speed and agility. Pound for pound, a quadruped is going to be more agile than a biped since they have two pairs of limbs to help control their turns. That's why, even though Tyrannosaurus was twice as agile proportionally as most other megatheropods, it was still outmatched in that department by Triceratops, which was about the same size and could turn even faster. However, with about a 5 ton difference in this category, the Paleoloxodon might be inferior to its opponent when it comes to agility, making its greater size a liability rather than an advantage. Without a complex biomechanical simulation to check, however, it's hard to tell. We'll call agility a tie, given the uncertainty involved. Speed is more clear-cut, although I'll say right now that it won't matter nearly as much. The fastest reliably measured elephant ever was a 2.8 ton Asian elephant male running at 15 miles per hour, or 24 kilometers per hour. Big adult African elephants move a fraction of that speed, and a 17-ton Paleoloxodon would be even slower. Evolutionarily, they had no reason to run quickly, apart from intraspecific charges during territorial or mating disputes, so they just had to be fast enough to catch other extremely slow quadrupeds. Compare that to the most recent speed estimates for Tyrannosaurus. An analysis by Adrian Boai and Scott Swan utilized muscle-driven techniques to calculate the top speed of various T-Rex specimens. The largest example they had, Sue, had a maximum speed range of 7.9 to 8.7 meters per second, or an average of 8.3 meters per second. 
That's equivalent to 18.6 miles per hour, or 29.9 kilometers per hour, significantly faster than even the fastest elephant ever recorded. Cope was somewhat larger than Sue, and so would be slower, but still would easily outpace his lumbering opponent. That's a point for the Rex. Weaponry and Defense Khan's most effective weapon by far is his sheer size. If he managed to pin down Cope and trample him, it would be game over, and his reinforced skull would be great for dealing out blunt force trauma if he can connect. So let's address the tusks in the room. Modern elephant combat between males and must rarely results in serious injuries. Tusks are ineffective goring weapons against animals in their own size class and are only used in serious fights once the loser is attempting to flee. Elephant ivory has low tensile strength, even lower than some varieties of bamboo, and tusks frequently fracture during combat. White and Hall Martin 2018 indicate that long tusks are impractical for combat purposes. It is difficult to imagine that very large tusks would be more useful as weapons or tools than smaller ones, but it may be that larger tusks are of symbolic value in dominant skirmishes or displays. They're used to being the only big kids on the block, so that's usually all they need to win. Benyus 2014 says that stabbing can be fatal if supported by the momentum of a rapid charge. Elephant skin is not proportionally thick, which is what allows for the occasional tusk fight to be dangerous. While that spiky charge may be effective in territorial bouts between Paleoxidon males, Tyrannosaurus is considerably faster. If the big theropod wanted to escape to regroup, distracting its opponent with a quick bite and then power walking away would be fairly easy. On the other hand, the elephant's charging attitude would be easy for the Tyrannosaurus to take advantage of, since we know from fossil evidence that they would face heavily armed Ceratopsians head on and rip the horns off of their skulls. 2022 bite force calculations for the specimen stand calculated a 25,000 newton force for the front of the mouth, which is the area of the skull most likely to contact flesh. Scaling the 11.8 meter stand up to the approximately 12.9 meter cope would yield around 32,000 newtons. While Tyrannosaurus teeth were not as specialized for cutting as Carcodontosaurids, they were still serrated and sharp enough to pierce flesh. With its wide gape and railroad spike teeth, Cope would be excellent at gripping large prey animals and ripping through skin, muscle, and bone all at once. However, bite effectiveness is different from bite force. A 2015 study found that T-Rex could utilize its maximum bite strength when its jaws were open at a 28 degree angle, which wouldn't cover much surface area on an enormous Paleoxodon. Perhaps that was an adaptation for decapitating Triceratops by grabbing the frills. That doesn't mean it couldn't exert enormous forces across wider areas, however. T-Rex's maximum gape was 63.5 degrees, leaving enough space between its maxilla and dentary for a short human to stand inside of. Given Cobe's enormous skull, it could bite off a couch-sized chunk of flesh at a time, likely fracturing any bones encountered in the process. A single hit would send its opponent into shock and extreme blood loss, perhaps instantly crippling it. While the Paleoxodon's tusks are long and brittle, better used as intimidation than pure combat, Cope handily takes weaponry. Not much is known about Tyrannosaurus integument. While some skin impressions may show pebble-like scales, the thickness is uncertain. It is true that the theropod's gastralia, essentially an extra rib cage protecting its torso's vital organs, would be helpful. Paleoxodon's tusks aren't positioned to stab from underneath to begin with. The elephant skin, while not thick relative for its size, would provide a loose surface to absorb tooth impact and reduce bite effectiveness. Again, there's a great deal of uncertainty here, so we'll call it a tie. Experience Experience is an interesting category. Neither combatant will have seen anything quite like the other. To the Rex, Khan smells somewhat like the tiny hairy things that run underfoot, but is larger than even the biggest Edmontosaurus. The tusks would appear similar enough to the horns of a Triceratops, even if they were curved inward rather than upward, but the trunk would seem bizarre. Perhaps this large hairy thing has a long neck? It at least smells edible, even if the acrid liquid on the sides of its face is less than appetizing. While weird, this enemy's overall body plan and weaponry isn't anything that Cope hasn't faced in its 30 plus year lifespan, but given its size, Cope would still be wary. From the elephant's perspective, it's suddenly confronted by an agile, extremely fast crocodile that crawled onto land and grew to nearly match its own size. Paleoloxodon nematicus, as an adult, had no natural predators, and large elephantids have never existed with carnivores big enough to seriously threaten full-grown individuals. They've always been able to rely on their size to simply intimidate away wannabes like lions and tigers. But all of a sudden, here's a hunter that's three quarters its size and specialized to hunt agile tanks with face spikes. Cope in particular would have been an extremely successful hunter, having lived to an age of greater than 30 years, and so would be experienced in how to maneuver around large hadrosaurs and ceratopsians to get in a killing blow. In this scenario, T-Rex is a complete baffling unknown with no ecological or morphological correlates in Paleoxodon's environment. When it comes to relevant combat experience, Tyrannosaurus easily takes the point. Intelligence and Senses 
These two are grouped together because they're both overrated when it comes to animal combat. If an unarmed human is facing off against a silverback gorilla in a wrestling match, it won't matter that the human has a PhD in theoretical physics. The gap in physical stats is too large for simple problem solving to overcome. The same is even more true of battles between animals, and in a fight, instinct takes over even in untrained humans. The violence of the moment matters far more than one fighter's ability to express abstract thought or lay careful plans that aren't relevant in a fight to the death. The same goes for senses. While Paleoxodon and Tyrannosaurus both had incredible smell and hearing, with T. rex also sporting some of the best visual acuity of any animal period and a foot structure that disguised its footsteps, those are only factors in an ambush scenario. For the purpose of this video, we'll give points to each side and call it good. Verdict. Khan takes size and strength while receiving tied points from agility, defense, intelligence, and senses. Cope has the same four ties and also takes home weaponry, speed, and experience, giving him more categories. But such a simplistic breakdown just makes it easier to organize the video. They're arbitrary and can't capture the nuances of a real battle that genuinely could go either way. My verdict is that Cope takes the victory 50 to 55% of the time, a very slim margin. The deciding factors would be the one track way angry elephants fight, what Tyrannosaurus was used to hunting, and how Cope's superior speed would give him an edge. But even then, it's close. A 17 ton animal is bigger than anything Cope would have hunted in his lifetime, but not massively so. Conversely, Khan never would have encountered a predator even close to 12 tons, much less one that could cripple him with a single bite. Cope's height would also allow him to get bites in at vulnerable areas like the sides and neck, as well as grab tusks from the front and potentially splinter them. The reason his win percentage isn't higher is the fact that Khan is simply enormous, and if a charge did connect, it could end the fight right there. But what about Khan being in must, you may ask? According to the literature, must represents aggression and willingness to fight, not actual combat ability. Bulls in must do tend to beat off bulls who aren't, but that's because they're advertising what they're willing to sacrifice in a confrontation. It increases aggression and reckless behavior, not physical strength. If anything, must might have turned out to be a disadvantage, since it would lower Khan's guard and allowed opportunities for Cope to strike. The winner, barely, is Copium Rex. Thank you for indulging me with this one. I don't usually do animal battles like this anymore, but the idea of Samson fighting the Indominus 2.0 inspired me to do an elephant theropod fight with real animals. I've got some really fun projects lined up on the channel in the future and can't wait to share them all with you. Subscribe to stay updated and become part of the community by joining the Discord server. Joining the channel provides unique perks like loyalty badges, early access to videos at higher tiers, and even getting to read chapters of my books during the drafting process. If you enjoyed this video, you might like my analysis of Megatheropods surviving in Cenozoic North America, or how Neanderthals would fare in the Morrison Formation. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time.